Excellent. We're live. Okay. I think. Um, how are you enjoying Slack? Uh, I I any- like it because it makes it easier to segregate work from uh, regular communications where I have people who I both work with and am friends with because mm-hmm. I, I like them and I don't want to ask them business questions on a weekend, but sometimes I want to abandon those business questions so somewhere. Have you started to adapt it to CosmoQuest or is it still yeah. just... You, no, we're using it for CosmoQuest. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't nag you if I didn't think it was going to change your life. So, I, um, I needed to see you use it and stick to it for more than six months. I, I think that's fair, Mr. Oh, early adopter I, and yeah, technology I do, jumper. I do adopt early. Yeah, I adopt early. Uh, Peach, is the, Peach is the new thing that I'm checking out. But No. <laughs> have you tried it? No. Well, then, <laughs> you have to stick judge. with it for six months. No. When you decide to switch your entire team off Slack and stay on that for six months, I'll consider it. Oh, I, no, no. Peach is, is a new social network. Oh, okay. Like That's Instagram. different. I'll take a look at it. Yeah. I still haven't really got on Instagram. I'm a Ooh, loser. Instagram is the greatest. We have I uh, we have sixty five thousand people following Universe Today on Instagram, and when we post a picture, we'll get three thousand people like the picture. You you don't see that anywhere else, right? Like I, I don't know. know how many people you see like a thing that you put on Twitter. Ten, maybe twenty. No, I often Car- get more than that. A hundred, not, right? Not, Three thousand, not yeah. always thousands, but yeah, thousands. Car and Carla's, you know, with her. Well, she's uh, a professional. She's amazing. Carla, Carla Thompson. Follow her on Instagram. She's got like thirteen thousand followers, and yeah, yeah. Really I, I need to go down the Instagram road. I just haven't got there yet. Yeah. I, what I need to do is figure out if this, then that, and then I can do all the things with less help. Yeah, but it's it's always Zapier is actually pretty good. It's a paid version, but it's got a lot more integrations. But it's all still it's very um, kludgy. Kludgy, yeah. And yeah. so nothing, you know, it doesn't make a proper Twitter post with a nice image and a night. You know what I mean? It's like nothing yeah. connects bolts together properly. The, so. the other thing I want to figure out because I'm sure one of these is the answer, but I don't know which is uh, the new workflow app that they have for the iPhone that in theory, creates a workflow that makes this stuff not suck. I don't know if it works. I need to try it. Mm. Um, hey, Matt Woods, Richard Clark, Jim Meeker, Patrick Festa, Giselle Sabarin, Guido Bibra, Thomas Traniker, Nancy Graziano, uh, Stephen Walker, did I already say that? Um, and a whole lot more Nancy Graziano. So uh, if you're wondering why I'm saying hello to all those people, I'm saying hello to all of the people who are using the Q&A app and they posted a hi comment in uh, in the Q&A app. So to f- get that, all you gotta do is just wherever you're watching this live, click that we're interacting with the audience. You'll get the, still be able to watch the video, but now you'll be able to um, uh, post some comments and questions for us. And this is gonna be a one episode that I think you're gonna wanna post a lot of comments and questions about. Um, now we've got an idea for next week and. Uh, uh, so people have always been asking us, like, can you do an update on, you know, because we've now been doing Astronomy Cast for eight years now. Yeah. And stuff has changed a little bit. And so the thought that we had was every hundred episodes, we'll do a state of the universe and just sort of give you an update on what's happening in dark matter, what's happening in dark energy, black holes, quasars, gravitational waves. Have they been discovered? Maybe, I don't know. No. Um, aliens, alien megastructures, things like that. And we'll just we'll just sort of run through, you know, what are some of the big insights, the new big discoveries that have happened. And then we'll do that every 100 episodes. And I think that's sort of, that'll be kind of fun to, to do, so. And, I, and next week's recording will be at a weirdo time yeah. because I'm going to be at the Aresia Con- Conference in Boston this weekend. And I'll be flying home Monday. So we're going to sort the time. Um, There's also a big NASA meeting, which we're we're going to sort. But just to warn you, it won't be our normal time. Follow the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They they know Mm -hmm. more about what we're doing than I sometimes know about what we're doing. Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, you absolutely should join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Uh, They are really the sort of the hive mind that we attach to. And uh, they are the producers now of more and more of of what we do, which is great. It's like by the fans, for the fans. You just tell us what space stuff you want. You tell us where to go. You tell us who to interview. You tell us what to take pictures of and what stories to write, and we'll bring it to you. So we live only to serve. Yes. Um. 
Cool. Okay. So uh, as always, we will take about half an hour, do an episode, um, and then we'll stick around and chat and talk about this. Uh, a few warnings. Yeah. Uh, number one is, you know, we're probably going to be talking about sex, sexual harassment, some abuse, things like that, verbal. abuse. So there might be some trigger warnings. I'm gonna I'm gonna say this again when we actually do the episode. So uh, just if if any of these topics are troubling to you, you may want to uh, go straight to episode 400. Go straight to episode 400, or or consume this episode in a in a place where you know if you're feeling emotional, uh, you can deal with it. Um, also, my computer is garbage and restarted in the middle of the Weekly Space Hangout and might do it again. Uh, I've tried swapping a new RAM. I've tried. I haven't replaced my power supply or my video card yet, but uh, it could very well just drop in the middle of this recording. And I'll just come back. Don't worry. And then we'll just keep going with the episode. So uh, you have been warned. I hope it won't kill my audacity. Hmm. Anyway, um, I may save my recording. Well, it'll go to the uh, YouTube anyway. We got yeah, backups. We'll okay. Be fine. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, the water to my house blew uh, a couple of about a week ago, and now we've got the construction crew here actually trying to fix it and replace it. And so it's very possible that a panicked worker is going to come into my uh, office in a second, and I'm going to have to go make some kind of horrible water-based decision so let's hope not but uh there you go uh cory Braid, i'm gonna say hi yeah you missed the shout out but you didn't miss the second shout out which is drossel andres munoz andres munoz didn't you win a meteorite andres um hey everybody okay let us get rolling with the show. I'm ready to press record. Are you ready to press record? Uh, I just discovered I had Word open. Yes, now I'm ready to press record. I'm pressing record. I have it's also pressed recording. record. It is hey, also Preston. recording. Hello, Preston. All right, here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 399, Women in Science. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, your weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos. We'll help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm good. I know you've had a pretty crazy week, which we're going to get into a little bit on, on this week's episode. So um, we're going to be handling a fairly difficult topic this week. So I think we want to give everyone an appropriate trigger warning. Uh, we're going to be talking about abuse. We're going to be talking about harassment, perhaps sex a little bit. So um, so just if, you know, if you're going to be, no, if you normally listen to Astronomy Cast with kids in the room, this is something you might want to listen to first and decide if it's sort of at the appropriate level for, for your family. Um, the second thing, though, is that next episode, next week is going to be our 400th episode, and that is going to be, a, we're going to call it the state of the universe, and we're going to update you on all of the stories that have been sort of changing since we started doing Astronomy Cast. So if this week's episode sounds a little heavy to you, and and then go straight to 400, and it's going to be a, a, a lot of fun. But but as I said, this is a very serious topic, and, um, and we're going to take it on. Are you ready to go, Pamela? Yes. Okay. So science is typically a male-dominated profession, mostly dudes, not a lot of ladies. From researchers to professors to lawmakers, women have a tough time gaining traction in such a heavily gendered field. Today, we're going to talk about what it takes to make it as a woman in science, what additional hurdles you'll have to overcome, and what resources are available if you're being harassed or discriminated against. So... I know less about being a woman in science than I know about astronomy. So I think this is perfect for me to uh, to ask you a bunch of questions, Pamela. And so I guess if anyone's been living under a rock over the last year or so, there have been a bunch of uh, sort of discrimination and harassment, sexual harassment uh, uh Things that have been going on for a long time that have finally been brought to light, and there's a lot of um, allegations and a lot of like potential court cases and and disciplinary actions that are being taken, and a lot of stories 
are are coming out and and the thing that you know we as the people who have no personal you know i have no personal experience with this whatsoever apart from the conversations that that you and i've had you know we're starting to learn the scale and the scope of of kind of what women go through being a scientist and so i think with with this episode pamela i'd love to kind of get uh, just get an understanding of your experiences of, of what it's been like to be a woman in a very male dominated field and then maybe you know help women who want to go into this field especially astronomy and how they can navigate and deal with sort of what what's potentially out there so uh where do you want to start it it's really hard to find a, a starting point, but I think perhaps the the best starting point is to just overview some of the big cases that have hit the news so that people know this isn't just me, this isn't just the two of us talking about our experiences, that there is this broader, long-term history that we're trying to reflect on. Um, sadly, it goes back as as far and as high as Nobel laureates. Uh, it was revealed this year that Richard Feynman had a long-term history of uh, being a predator, of going after his grad students' girlfriends, of claiming to be a co-ed and going after undergraduates. And yet he's still revered. And when people try and add that asterisk of there was this misbehavior, they get abused. Yeah. Um, it and went from, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I, in, in more recent times, building on this foundation of Feynman, uh, and, and there was also issues with Nobel laureate James Watson and with uh, the man who the Hubble Space Telescope is named after, James Webb. But, but those are people of the past. Unfortunately, we can't claim that this is gone today. We've had just in the past year or so, a uh, Waterman Award and Warner Prize winner, Srinivas uh, Kalkarni of Caltech, discussed how astronomy is a field of boys with toys. Uh, also at Caltech, we had it revealed this week that Christopher Ott uh, had emotional longings, is I guess the best way to put it, with one of his graduate students. And when she didn't live up to his expectations he fired her and there's of course the the jeff marcy scandal that broke earlier in the year and we we covered that as well quite a bit in the weekly space hangout but you know again sort of same same situation but but it's not just men that are putting this hey it's just sex between adults pressure out there there, there are women who are also saying, be silent, just figure out how to deal with it. Lily Award and Evans Award winner Alice S. Hong uh, published an advice column recommending that a female postdoc whose advisor kept looking down her shirt should just tough it out. Um, while science did retract the article with an apology, there were still a whole lot of people that jumped up to defend what this researcher wrote. And there are many people who do think that it's it's not a big deal. Boys look, girls look. If your advisor's looking down your shirt, hey, leverage that. Right. Uh, and so, you know, when, I mean, you've always been a scientist, you know, you were a super space nerd as a kid, you went to space camp, yes. you, you know, watched your science fiction and knew that you were going to be a scientist from a pretty early age. Um, when did you realize that your gender was, was sort of, uh, was a factor in you being a scientist? When I was 15. Um, I don't think I've ever told this story. I, uh, I, as everyone knows, who's followed me or talked with me for any amount of time, um, I was a foreign exchange student on a science exchange to the Soviet Union, but that grew out of a people to ex people exchange where, uh, I, along with 20 some odd other students ages 15 to 18, was uh, invited to go and compete in the International Science Olympics 
as as representatives of the U.S. And we were all put up in dormitories in this small village in the mountains of what is now Russia. And at one point, I was in the bathroom with the door open to my roommate, shaving my legs, dressed, but with my leg in the sink, and um, our chaperone, a Harvard-affiliated researcher, came in and talked to me and stared at me in the bathroom while I was shaving my legs. And all of us on that trip realized we were kind of on our own and things happened that shouldn't have happened. And we were children, we mm -hmm. were children. Yeah, 15 years old in a foreign country with uh, caretakers who were supposed to be there to you know, protect you and watch over you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, personal, and I'm assuming, I'm, I, you know, we could take hours and you could regale, you know, you've already told me numerous events about, you know, people oogling you and, and making really sort of snide comments and, and, and that, and, and I know that, that you've had these conversations with tons of your coworkers and some of the stories are, are pretty harrowing. But but sort of when did you get a sense that there was more of a systematic problem above and beyond, you know, one that was directed maybe as you as a female? When did you realize that systematically there's a problem for females in science? I, I'd have to say that it was in the mid-2000s. I started to realize in talking to women that there were women out there, strong, brave, courageous women, often graduate students, who had found the courage to not just put up with it, who had been better people than to just leverage and use it. They'd instead done the right thing, and they'd gone to their universities and said, I need help. I'm being abused. I'm being harassed. I'm being told there are these things I have to do were put up with and this is wrong and every single case that I heard about until Jeff Marcy the man involved was given a written slap on the wrist maybe was asked to attend sexual harassment training and the woman was silenced and told she was not allowed to say anything because her complaint was confidential and she had to stay in the same department. And there was always this threat. If you talk about that complaint, if you tell anyone about that complaint, even though I was found guilty, I can sue you. Right. And so the women just, they just leak away. Now, when you say, I mean, you say leak away, I mean, do you say that, that women quit the field, that they look for different jobs, that they, you know, I mean, what kinds of, what's the outcome of this? With, with students, they often just walk away and go find something else to do with their lives. I know of one woman who went from being a graduate student in astronomy, something that is very, very difficult to get into. And the cost of being a female graduate student for her in the situation she was in was too high. And so she found a way to creep out of astronomy and into a different non-physical science and got a PhD and went on to be a professor utterly outside of astronomy. Right. In, in other cases, women do try and find other jobs. But on any given day, if it's a good day, there might be five jobs in the entire world in an individual subfield. How the hell do you get one of those jobs when it's the person abusing you who's the most qualified in theory to write that rec letter? Yeah, and you just did a post on on your website, Starstrider. You called it abuse, and I think it's a fantastic post. Some of the best stuff you've ever written. Uh, and you mentioned that one of the problems with astronomy specifically is just how small the industry is. You know, in my field, computer science, if if somebody, if I have a problem with somebody, I can work in a different company, I can work in a different city, I can, you know, change my specialty. But as the field narrows, like astronomy, you're stuck interacting with these people for your entire professional career. 
When when I lived in Boston, I was having a conversation with my soon to be husband who's a computer scientist and I was trying to get him to understand how small the field of astronomy is because he was just baffled that there are people in our field that have known me since I was 14 and that I still run into them on a regular basis. And I remember pointing out to him, there were more computer scientists in the city of Boston than astronomers in the world. And, and with a field that tiny, you, you can never escape somebody. I, I like so many people who got a degree in astronomy. I dated other students at different points in my career. And the crazy thing is, I, I find myself in business meetings going, oh shit, that's the guy I dated when I was 22. How do I hide behind my coffee cup for the next three days? And it's not that it was a terrible relationship. It's just, I was stupid and young. And sometimes you just want to forget the things you did when you were stupid and young. But when you look across the room and the person you see is that person who grabbed you, that person who insisted on sex, that person who verbally abused you until you cried every single time you were in their office. When it's an abuser and a bully and a harasser that you see across the room, it kills you inside. And you realize, I have to figure out how to professionally interact with this person when all I want to do is run to the other corner of the planet and you're legally required to not say anything. And so you're really having to choose between your career, which, you know, in the case of science, I mean, you know, you've always felt called to science, called to astronomy specifically. Yeah. And a lot of these other women as well. I mean, you know, you know, my experience with, I mean, we're really fortunate with all of the people we interact with on with CosmoQuest and with, with this, the weekly space hangout. There's a lot of, you know, professional working astronomers, women uh, who are really passionate and know their stuff and are as, as nerdy about the science as, as anybody. And just imagine that if on top of, of your love of the science, you had to deal with this additional stuff. You know, I can't even imagine what goes through your head and the the level of uh, of just anxiety and stress that's just piled on top of an already really difficult field to be in. We try and take care of each other. I I remember being at a meeting with a bunch of other women who work in the NASA community in science communications and education, and at at one point I was like. I, I really hope I, I don't have to work with one of the male people who was at the meeting because this was somebody who, when he was drunk, grabbed my boob at one point, as you do, at a conference, at a bar. And at I mean, you say that so flippantly, right? But it's, anyway. It, it, that's not serious. I have to be flippant. I have to okay. respect that my story is so minor compared yeah. to some of the women out there. And it became a, oh yeah, that happened to me. And it was every woman in the room had experienced something from this guy who's high up in our field and controls funding. And we all know, and you just, you just learn to take it on the cuff and hope that it's not worse than that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I'd like to switch a little bit to sort of some of your advice and sort of get a, give a sense of, you know, like if you're, a, you know, if you're an undergrad, if you're going into astronomy or one of the other sciences and, you know, there are these like secret networks of women who, who sort of warn people coming into these fields, isn't there? Yes. In, in fact, when, when I applied for graduate school, uh, I had two different job offers to be a research assistantship for two different professors. And I had multiple women pull me aside and say, do not work for Professor A. Uh, Professor A has since then actually been removed from the field of astronomy very quietly. And 
kudos to the University of Texas for finally getting rid of him. And I will gladly work at Texas again because they did that. But they hadn't got rid of him yet when I got to Texas. And I had a administrative assistant and multiple research scientists pull me aside and say, don't even be in an elevator with him if you can avoid it. And I, I have to admit to hitting the door closed button on this man mm -hmm. because it was easier. Um, so yeah, we try to protect each other, but the, but the problem is there's always going to be mistakes made. I, I did work for a researcher at one point where uh, a friendly senior scientist had said, look, he's a bit of a misogynist. You might have problems. And I was young and I was stupid. And I was like, no, I can get along with anyone. Um, I was an idealist. I figured if you work hard enough, if you are good enough, if you can do your job, your gender does not matter. That's what I thought. That's what I wanted to believe. But it's not true. And and so the Whisper Network tried to keep me safe. Mm -hmm. And my youth and my idealism, uh, yeah, I walked right into that. It, it's like the saying, His, Hitler never played Risk as a child. Well, uh, I was a bit Pollyanna and decided that uh, invading Asia in the winter was a fine idea. Right. Now, now, I mean, these are, you know, you said the word misogyny, and I think that's, you know, we've got the sort of like the really direct uh, abuse, the discrimination, uh, the harassment, things like that. But there's this lower grade misogyny that also kind of runs through these the science field as well. The one that is that is putting men in positions above women. The one that is setting salary levels differently. The one that is, you know, that is that is kind of enforcing the ratios that we see. So, can you talk a bit about that? So, when selecting a job, a woman often has to make the decision. Would I rather work someplace where I am objectified, seen as a sexual object, and have to deal with sexual harassment? Do I want to select a workplace where I will face gender discrimination, where there's nothing blatant, but clearly the women just can't make it? Or do I want to choose a place where, in fact, it goes so far as uh, <laughs> women are dealing with the outright, well, women can't succeed in this field, and hearing men talk about, oh, she's married, she must not be serious, while they say, oh, that male colleague, he got married, now there's someone to free him up to do research. Wow. Uh, and so you know, how much of that is is the case going across the, the field? I know of three senior women who have said, oh, I never dealt with anything like that. Three. Three, total, right. So you know three senior yeah. women who've reached sort of the top of their field and never experienced either harassment discrimination or just general misogyny for their career. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's like the opposite, right? Like, can you find, how many men can you find who have experienced that? Right. You'd have a hard time putting together some names. Well, and, and one of the hardest parts about this is while well, women can talk to one another hidden in secrecy, knowing that we're breaking the confidential confidentiality rules, but needing to talk so that we don't fall apart. Mm -hmm. The thing is, in order to talk to one another, we do have to break confidentiality rules. When you file a complaint in most academic organizations, you have to say your complaint will be kept confidential. You will not tell anyone you complained, and the university will not tell anyone you complained. And the results of the complaint will also be kept secret. This means if you try and get institutional help, every single time you say to another woman, you need to be careful, I had some problems with that guy. You're breaking the rules. Right. 
Uh, so I'd like to shift, you know, in the last sort of 10 minutes of this, of this episode to sort of advice and strategies for, for what, what women can do. And then I'd love to hear your recommendations about we as men and as allies to this problem can, can help with as well. So let's start with, with what the women can do. So if you're, you know, if you're going into a, a science field, what sort of actions should you take that maybe, uh, you know, your male colleagues wouldn't even, you know, be something that they would have to do? One thing I think we've all made the mistake of at some point or another is you delete emails, you delete correspondences just because seeing hateful things hurts. Keep everything. Use something like Google Inbox where you can just swipe it away so you never have to see it again, but it's still stored there forever. This way, if you ever do need the evidence, you have it. This is what really helped those graduate students at Caltech is they had the chat histories from inappropriate conversations. Protect yourself through documentation. It sucks. You shouldn't have to go through your email and occasionally see that file name that is their name where you've kept that documentation. But it's really the only way to protect yourself. And find that senior woman or senior man who is an advocate, who can be your mentor, who can plug you into those whisper networks and who can be there when you just don't know how to deal with something because you're in completely over your head. Over my career, uh, women I've turned to have included Lynn Kaminsky at Sonoma State, Susanna Doistia at Space Telescope Science Institute, Angela Speck, who's at the University of Missouri. At, at various times, I've, I've gone to each of them and said, I just don't know how to deal with this. And they've helped me. Find those people who are just a little bit or a lot ahead of you and who care and let them help you. Asking for help's hard, yeah. but it's how we survive. And and I think, you know, we're not at the place yet where where the um, the resources, where the the infrastructure is there to to really protect people who are who are having these problems, you know, we're getting closer, and you can definitely see with all of the allegations that have come out and all of the action that's being taken this year, that we're definitely getting closer. That it's a safer space than it was, and and you know that advice to just like tough it too, when people are staring at your boobs, just tough it out. No, where. You know, where do you kind of sit on that spectrum? You know, is there, you know, is there genuine career killing landmines right now? Or or can you find your way to support and navigate out and still have your career and also have these these uh, these people taken care of? Um, I think I'll know more about if there's career killing landmines in a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, yeah. The the issue you run into is when you come forward and you say, look, I'm having a problem. The person you're having a problem with can make up whatever the hell they want. And it's your word against theirs. And in a lot of cases, people don't want to believe. And it's unfortunately easier for people to believe that you're lying than to believe that someone they know and maybe respect is capable of abuse. The problem the Catholic Church had that allowed them to swap priests and bishops between different churches while the pedophilia went on and on. It's not that different in academia where our profs get shuffled from institution to institution and the abuse goes on. The military saw it. They got better we can do better but we're at that point that the military was at five five or so years ago where it was starting to be talked about that women were being abused they were being raped they were being harassed we're at that point in astronomy now and i can only hope that we find our own way to approve things but the landmines are unlabeled and they're still being found and so what can we do then as you know I mean, I think start with the men who are who are in the institutions, the ones who are the allies, the ones who are the uh, who want to help this problem go away, but they're not sure where to 
where to start? What would you recommend that they do? The, the most powerful thing they can do at a certain level is be the person who's there going, not cool, dude, when someone makes a sexist or gendered or racist or any of the other issues based comment. We're talking about the issues women face today. It's easy to talk about that because we at least have roughly 10% women at the highest levels in astronomy. But there's almost no people of color and what they face is worse in many instances. There are issues against people of religion. There are issues against people who don't have cis-normative hetero relationships. Um, when you see inappropriate conduct, don't be the person who just pretends to laugh because it's easier to fit in. Be the person who says, not cool, what you're saying hurts. Don't force the women to be the ones saying it. When you see policies that as a dad, you know, wow, that's going to make it hard for people with kids, say something. When you see situations that are going to put women into awkward and potentially unsafe environments, pull them aside and say, are you okay with this? Can I help? Do we need to change something? Be the person who works to protect, protect the ability of a woman to focus on science instead of focusing on safety. I, I hate that I have to quite literally worry about, is there a wall behind my butt occasionally? And cross my arms when I'm at the bar and someone might be able to sidle up and grab something I don't want them to grab. Be the person, John Hookra, who's sadly passed away and was a fabulous person in astronomy. He was that guy you need to be. There, there was one night at a AAS meeting, I'd had a drunk graduate student who really wanted to get into new media and was a creeper, stalker, scary dude, um, while drunk, lunge at me. Uh, someone else, a male, large colleague, got in between and basically said, hey, you want to dance in a way that's scared off the grad student, but I was creeped out. Mm -hmm. He tried to grab me and I went and hit at the bar and John Hooker was like, hey, what's up? He didn't say it that way. He's older and friendly, but not like that. Um, and, and I basically explained that I was hiding from a creeper and he was like, you know, I haven't always been an astronomer. I used to be a teamster. Do you want me to go do something? And, and <laughs> that was sort of like, wow, thank you, you're awesome. And then he was like, look, I know this guy's department chair, give him a call, he'll help. Mm -hmm. Be the person who gives the woman the, this person is safe to talk to and he will help you advice. And what kinds of changes at a systematic level do you think would make sense to sort of help out? The most important thing that I think could happen is when someone is found to be guilty of sexual harassment, of creating a discriminatory work environment, or of retaliatory behavior. Just like we force uh, sex crimes people to register, let's, let's put those abuses public. Let's make our academic community aware of who are the people in our field who have done things so that maybe they don't so easily rise to power. When, one of the things that I wrote about in, in my blog post is, is this problem that you hear Professor A, he was at this one campus, and while he was there, some things happened, he left. It's all kind of confusing. There's suspicions, and you worry. And when he does something to you, it's kind of like, well, nothing happened at the prior university. Can I, can I talk? When you hear, hey, he was at university too and all of these horrible things happened but no one did anything you hold your tongue until you're forced to scream because you can't be silent about your abuse any longer when it's university number three and you find out that he's been reminding his victims you're under a confidentiality agreement if you say anything i'll sue you just don't even speak. 
you just die inside. You kill that part of you that has to die that you might somehow figure out how to stay in this field that you spent your entire life struggling to be a success in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, take this stuff seriously and take the action. Don't try to hide it under the rug. Right. That's that. And that's, you know, it's what happened with the Catholic scandal. And that's what, that's what happens with, with the, the harassers, they get moved, they get, you know, they, it gets covered up as opposed to getting brought into the light of day and, 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 and everyone, getting properly disciplined at the right time. Everyone talks about how we can't harm his, his career. He's a good researcher, but one abuser can harm dozens of women. Mm -hmm who are no longer making intellectual contributions to our field or, or who are, are crippled in their ability to make contributions to our field. Because our field values one man so much higher than all of those women, all of those women learn they don't matter. If we could just say, if we adequately punish this man and protect the victims and allow them the ability to have spa safe spaces where they don't have to fear. How much more will we discover about our universe? Because all of those women realize I am valued. My contribution does matter. And my safety and my ability to succeed matters more than his ability to succeed and potentially keep victimizing people. Wow. Well, thank you, Pamela. Uh, we went a little long, but it, it was uh, it was really great, and uh, I really appreciate you talking about this. I know it was a really difficult topic, and I really hope it, that if we can help any of the uh, you know any women in science, going into science, undergrads, furthering their career, you know, aware of issues that are going on, and then all of the men and allies who who say that they want to you know, decrease the discrimination and to catch it and call it for what it is when they see it and to, to step forward and to the institutions that really need to take this stuff seriously and make the universities and research organizations a safe place for, for women to do great work it would be really great. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. And now we save. Now we save. Thank you all for staying tuned for such a hard topic. More fun next week. Send, export. And then apparently I did have some kind of plumbing related issue. I have to go, I'll go away for one second. Okay. You can maybe answer some questions while I. Okay. Um, so, so we have from Nancy Graziano. She, Oh, I don't have the select tool. Um, she writes, uh, I know you cannot talk about specifics, but how do you feel about spouses condoning their partner's abusive actions toward their students and others? I, I think this is a really ugly situation. In court of law, we don't generally ask spouses to speak about one another. In fact, women and men are protected from being forced to give testimony about their spouse. This is because of bias that's involved and because, let's face it, you don't want to go on the record saying, uh, my husband, my wife sucks, they did this horrible, awful thing. We've seen countless cases of politicians standing up and saying, I'm sorry, while their spouse stands beside them, being publicly supportive. You know, a lot of those people standing next to their adulterous husband would really like to just be moving out and getting on with their life and getting a divorce. But because of their public roles because sometimes your public and private lives get entangled, especially in fields like astronomy, where you're co-authoring papers, you're traveling to conferences together. There is this necessity, just like between the Clintons, of we have to publicly mutually support one another. Um, and there's the bias of love. There's, there's problems. And I don't think 
a spouse can unbiased, unbiasedly address the research, the ethics, or any of the other things that their husband or wife is doing. There is bias in love. Um, okay, scrolling down through the questions. Um, a lot of positive feedback from everyone. I really, really appreciate that. It's It's been a rough week. So I see from Andrew. Uh, Andres Munoz, uh, what do you think of Hispanic Latinos in the science field? Is there also a struggle for them, mainly in the physics astronomy fields? One, one of the biggest problems I have is we live in a diverse nation. Uh, we are reaching the point where people of color are going to, by number, dominate our nation if they don't already in, in the coming years. I, I don't track census data the way I should. But we have a very diverse field with, um, sorry, my phone is ringing and I need to decline this. Um, we, we're, we're in a very diverse field, a uh, very diverse nation. But when you look at the field of astronomy, it is white and male, um, kind of at all ages. It varies as you get younger. The ones that aren't white and male are almost always white and female. I, I can't think of an American-born Hispanic or Latino astronomer. And that deeply, deeply troubles me. There are so few people of African-American descent in astronomy that at conferences you can usually count them on one hand, even the biggest conferences. And that is wrong. There are brilliant people in a Gaussian distribution of all colors, of all orientations. And every time we say there's no space for your color, there's no space for your gender, for your orientation that isn't what is the uh, historic norm, we're maybe getting rid of the Einstein that instead of being German is a South American immigrant to the United States. We're, we're losing her ability to make that next great discovery in a timely fashion by saying, well, discovery is limited and we're going to make it that much harder. We are going to be biased against anyone who's not that white male. There's paper after paper on this. Um, the most troubling that I read recently was a gender-based one where it's about uh, if a man and a woman uh, write a paper together, it's kind of assumed the woman gave no work on it, so she gets no credit for it. It counts 2% towards her academic success while it counts 8% towards his. Um, we need to change that. And again, the reason we talk about women is because there just isn't a stati statistically significant number of minorities. Sorry about that. My uh, plumbing ditch is caving in because it's so wet down there. And I'm not sure what we have okay. to do now. This is so dumb. Anyway, uh, but thank you so much for for taking over there. Okay, so I, I answered Nancy and Andres Munoz's question. Um, looking to see what other questions. Apparently some people have been getting file errors. Hopefully everything will be fine on YouTube and we did record everything locally. So Preston will be editing together our recordings and posting that hopefully next Monday. Um, Scrolling to the top, okay, I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of other questions. I, we may have gotten most of it. Um, looking on Twitter. And you saw that Nancy said she's talking to her representative? No, I didn't see that. I was scrolling for question marks, and if your message didn't have a question mark, I have to admit I scrolled past it. Um, Thank you, Nancy. We need more voices. We need more people saying, help uh, Congresswoman Jackie Sphere reform Title IX so that it's not a way to hide our abusers. Yeah, well, why don't we wrap this up then and I can go and deal with my plumbing. So. And I'm going to go and attempt to well, first find out who were the three people who called me while we were recording. Um, and uh, I have NASA presentations I have to prepare. 
So I want to NASA thanks. NASA's good. Yep. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you all later.